Hello everyone, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Steven Roth, and I'm a board-certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. And today's video is the latest installment of my syndrome series, where I'll be discussing Sjogren's Syndrome. I'll be doing a very in-depth, deep dive, so if you'd like to skip around or repeat certain segments of the video, feel free to use the chapter tool in the description, but first we have to get into that disclaimer, and that is that all of the opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone, and do not represent any organization that may employ me or that I may belong to, and that this video is for educational purposes only and should not serve as medical advice. Should you have any concerns about your oral or systemic health care? please see your nearest oral or systemic health care provider. And with that being said, let's get into today's video. Sjogren's syndrome, unlike many of the other syndromes in my syndrome series, is not necessarily an inherited condition, but rather a constellation of symptoms that comprise a larger entity or umbrella that we call Sjogren's syndrome. You can check out my other syndrome series video at the link above, and don't forget to subscribe so you can see more syndrome series videos just like this one. The two main findings in Sjogren's syndrome are dry eyes, or xerophthalmia, and dry mouth, or xerostomia. Sjogren's syndrome is seen mostly in middle-aged adults, and there is a marked female predilection as 90% of patients with Sjogren's syndrome are female. Patients with autoimmune and inflammatory conditions are at risk for developing additional autoimmune conditions, and that is definitely true for Sjogren's syndrome. 15% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and 30% of patients with lupus erythematosus develop Sjogren's syndrome during their lifetime. Xerophthalmia, or dry eyes related to inflammatory disease, is termed keratoconjunctivitis sicca. This can present as a scratchy sensation of the eye, and patients may feel as though something is stuck in their eyes. Over time, the surface of the eye becomes more scratched due to the lack of natural lubrication that protects it, which can eventually lead to blurred vision. Xerostomia, or dry mouth, is relatively common. It's one of the most common side effects of medication, and in fact, in order to be considered for Sjogren's syndrome, medication-related xerostomia must be ruled out. Also, patients on the burning mouse syndrome spectrum may have what we call perceived xerostomia, or the feeling of dry mouth, without actually being dry. A full discussion of this can be found in my burning mouse syndrome video, and you can find that video at the link above. Xerostomia can lead to many issues, including difficulty swallowing, altered taste, opportunistic yeast or candida overgrowth, and even increased cavities. Patients with Sjogren's syndrome may also present with a non-painful or perhaps slightly tender enlargement of the major salivary glands, which is usually bilateral and occurs in approximately one-third to one-half of patients. Other symptoms of Sjogren's syndrome outside of dry eyes and dry mouth include dry skin, dry nasal and vaginal mucosa, fatigue and depression, primary biliary cirrhosis, kidney and lung involvement, and Raynaud's, which is changing of the fingers, as well as many other vascular nerve issues. Sjogren's syndrome uh, has a very complex diagnostic scheme, and I'll be going over the two major classification systems in this video. The first is the American European Consensus Group, and the second is shorter and simpler, and it's the American College of Rheumatology criteria. In my practice, I usually use the American European Consensus Group as it includes subjective findings, which are experiences of the patient, in addition to objective findings, which are things that I can observe. Before evaluating a patient using the American European Consensus Group criteria, there are several factors that exclude patients from a Sjogren diagnosis. These other factors uh, can explain the patient's symptoms outside of this inflammatory condition. These exclusion criteria include past head and neck radiation, hepatitis C infection, AIDS, lymphoma, sarcoidosis, graft-versus-host disease, and anticholinergic medications. All of these may explain the patient's dryness separate from a true Sjogren syndrome. Assuming that none of these exclusion criteria apply, you can begin to evaluate a patient using six categories. The first is ocular symptoms experienced by the patient, oral symptoms experienced by the patient, ocular signs, 
salivary gland signs, histopathology, and finally serologic testing of the blood. The first category is ocular symptoms, which is a subjective finding where the patient is describing their experience. Do the patients feel that their eyes have been dry for more than three months? Or have they used excessive amount of tear substitutes? The second category is very similar, but it is oral subjective symptoms. Similarly, has the patient had a dry mouth for more than three months? Or are they drinking excessive amounts of water or using excessive amounts of salivary substitutes? These subjective findings, based on the patient's description of their symptoms and their experience, are considered alongside the remaining objective or measurable findings. Objective ocular findings of dryness can be measured a few ways. The first is called a Schirmer test, which is the insertion of a specific type of paper between the eye and the eyelid. The paper then wicks up the moisture from the eyelid mucosa and can be measured. If the moisture on that piece of paper measures less than five millimeters in five minutes, it's considered a positive test. The other test for objective ocular dryness is a Rose Bengal score, where a specific type of stain is placed onto the eye. Most patients are able to clear this stain with their natural tears and the natural moisture of the eyes and eyelids. But if the stain persists, it is graded based on specific scoring criteria, the area of the eye that's persisting, and the intensity with which it persists. Next is the evaluation of objective salivary gland function. This can be measured pretty easily. You simply have a patient spit in a cup for 15 minutes, and if they produce less than 1.5 milliliters of saliva, then it's supportive of the diagnosis. The next test is the minor salivary gland biopsy, and that's where I'll be spending most of my time discussing in this video. This is often where I get involved. Many clinicians consider this the gold standard of Sjogren's syndrome diagnosis. And while it can be helpful, it often isn't this magic test with all of the answers. Instead, it is imperative that it is considered as one factor in a multifactorial diagnosis. In these biopsies, the minor salivary glands being examined are often taken from the lower lip. The pathologist then looks at a specific type of inflammation around the ducts that release the saliva. The number of areas with this specific type of inflammation around ducts is divided by the total area of the salivary glands using a specific formula that results in a focus score. A focus score of one or more is supportive of a Sjogren syndrome diagnosis, and the greater the focus score, the greater the correlation to Sjogren syndrome. Like I said before, this is supportive, but some patients with Sjogren syndrome will not have gland inflammation visible on their biopsies. Also, the lower lip is exposed to a lot of trauma through everyday life, whether it being eating or speaking or just normal wear and tear, and that can lead to inflammation that is completely unrelated to Sjogren's syndrome. Inflammation of minor salivary glands of the lip is not uncommon, and we see inflammation in glands in non-Sjogren patients that were biopsied for completely different reasons like mucociles quite frequently. Another thing to consider is that biopsies are not without risk. Some minor salivary gland biopsies can lead to mucociles, which I just mentioned, which are ruptured salivary gland ducts leading to mucus spilling into the lip. It could also lead to damage of a nerve, which is removed with the minor salivary glands. This can lead to paresthesia of the lip or loss of sensation. In addition, the removal of functional glands in a patient with dryness may lead to further dryness and certainly doesn't help things. Minor salivary gland biopsy is a component, but other considerations must be taken before it is performed. The last category is serologic testing for autoantibodies. Autoantibodies are antibodies that our own body produces against our own tissues. Patients with Sjogren's may have elevated SSA or Rho and or SSB or LA antigens. These elevated antigens are seen in up to 75% of Sjogren's syndromes depending on the study. Using all of the criteria I just discussed, if the patient has four of the six criteria, including either the positive minor salivary gland biopsy or the serologic studies, the patient is considered positive for Sjogren's syndrome. 
All of this to say that the diagnosis of Sjogren's is very complicated and more than just symptoms or more than just a minor salivary gland biopsy or more than just serology. It's a combination of all of these findings. The American College of Rheumatology classification is much easier. A patient is considered positive for Sjogren's syndrome if they have two of the three following objective findings. These findings are either positive serology, a minor salivary gland biopsy with a focus score greater than one, and or objective ocular findings using the tests that I described earlier. So what do you do once a Sjogren's diagnosis has been established? Unfortunately, not much. The most important aspect of Sjogren management is the monitoring for lymphoma. As patients with Sjogren syndrome are at a significant increased risk for developing lymphoma in their lifetime compared to a patient without Sjogren syndrome, which is why this really is not a trivial diagnosis to make. Most Sjogren treatment is aimed at symptom relief. Patients will likely need continued adjunctive artificial tears and saliva throughout their life. Some patients may initially benefit from certain medications that increase secretions, but if there's no residual function of the gland remaining, these medications may not work. Patients will also need very close monitoring of the oral cavity for candida or yeast overgrowth and caries or cavities. It may benefit the patient to receive fluoride trays and to use prescription toothpaste to prevent excessive decay of their teeth due to the lack of saliva production. Thank you for joining me on this very in-depth deep dive of Sjogren's syndrome. I hope that you found this video informative and if you did, please share it with someone else that may find it helpful as well. If you haven't subscribed already, consider hitting that subscribe button and while you're there, you might as well give this video a like as well. Thanks again for watching and be well.